Hello, my name is Keith Jones. Welcome to my video about the uh, North Carolina Regulators and the Battle of Alamance. The Battle of Alamance fought on Thursday, May 16, 1771, was the climax of a very bellicose tax protest between a group known as the North Carolina Regulators and the colonial government of North Carolina. For several months, the regulators had been petitioning and protesting uneven taxes and governmental corruption at both the colonial and the local levels. As this built up into threats and violence, it became known as the War of Regulation. The entire regulator movement numbered nearly 7,000 members, and of those, there were about 2,000 who encamped along Alamance Creek in modern-day Alamance County, North Carolina. This is the battleground where the ultimate battle would be fought. At the time, this was all part of Orange County, although they uh, outnumbered Governor William Tryon's royal militia by two, two to one, they were untrained and ill-equipped. This engagement proved to be a catastrophe for the regulators, but it constituted what some historians consider the actual first shots of the American Revolution. The regulator movement began in the spring of 1768. For years there had been a divide between the more influential eastern counties and the backwoods counties in the Piedmont region. During this period, William Tryon went from being the royal lieutenant governor to taking the helm as governor. In those days, the county officials were all appointed by the governor, which led to a lot of cronyism and graft. Tryon ran the colony's government out of New Bern, which is near the coast. It's about 170 miles from this spot. Uh, this placed these appointed officials well out of sight and accountability of the government. This gave rise to what was known as courthouse rings. This primarily was led by the sheriff, the tax collector, and the judge. The tax collector would uh, mark up any tax bill, send the actual amount to the governor, then pay off the sheriff and the judge with the rest. In 1766, a group of citizens from the Hall River section in Colonial Orange County began holding meetings to file petitions with the governor. The Crown Attorney, Edmund Fanning, who was also a colonel over the local militia, took actions to prevent these meetings. There were retaliatory taxes uh, filed by local officials, which escalated the tensions. Fanning declared the uh, meetings to be an insurrection, and the committee formed by the uh, citizens answered these charges in court. Naturally, they had a hard time obtaining an attorney. When they did, he was bullied in open court and quit. Another sympathetic lawyer allowed the committee to study his law books and gave them advice. This was discovered by Fanning, and uh, according to committee member Herman Husbands, he was soon put out of commission, whatever that means. They continued filing petitions, and uh, in the mid-1768, Tryon, who at first had tried to be conciliatory, had reversed himself. Tryon was building himself a, a grand mansion, in New Bern, which became known as Tryon's Palace. This largesse did not sit well with Western settlers who were unlikely to ever set eyes on it and then increase their resentment. This gave rise to a large riot by a group calling themselves the Mob. They later changed their name to the Regulators. They were labeled as insurgents and rebels and eventually began refusing to pay any tax above what they actually owed. When the sheriff attempted to uh, seize a horse from one of them in payment, a mob arose and this led to a riot. The next day, Herman Husbands and another man were arrested and at their trial on September 22nd of 1768, the Hillsboro riot ensued. Officials were assaulted and uh, Edmund Fanning's home was destroyed by a mob which disassembled it. Now, these events continued growing until January of 1771 when Tryon engineered passage of the Johnston Riot Act. 
a sweeping measure which allowed him to call out the militia and hunt down the regulators and put a stop to this insurrection. The act was later rejected by the Privy Council in England uh, in a meeting that King George III himself sat in on and approved uh, their resolution or their uh, reaction. And they called it full of danger in its operation and irreconcilable to the principles of the Constitution and that it was altogether unfit for any part of the British Empire. Tryon had been named to be the new governor of New York in February of 1771, but as his last act, he called out the militia to put down the regulators. The militias from the various parts of the state were to meet and join in this section of modern-day Alamance County. Along the way, there were bloodless showdowns uh, between the militia and bands of regulators. Notably, a wagon train of powder and ammunition was hijacked and destroyed by regulators near Salisbury. The regulators then faced down militia under General Hugh Waddell uh, at the, uh, at the uh, Yadkin River and uh, turned them back without firing a shot. This fed the regulators' fantasy that they could flex their muscles and force the governor into submitting without actual bloodshed. Now finally, the two forces were within six miles of one another by May 13th of 1771. They were encamped in uh, various spots just up the road in uh, the various uh, highways feeding into this, uh, to this battlefield here. Over the next three days, several attempts were made to negotiate a peaceful solution by representatives of the regulators. The Reverend David Caldwell, a Presbyterian minister and son-in-law of Alexander Craighead, who was a central figure in the spiritual life of North Carolina during the Great Awakening, was one of the primary negotiators. He was, uh, Reverend Caldwell was the uh, minister of the Alamance uh, Presbyterian Church, uh, nearby. A large number of Caldwell's church members were among the regulators. Caldwell secured a promise from Tryon that he would not fire on the regulators until he had fairly tried what could be done by negotiation. Dr. Carol Troxler says that it appears that Tryon simply meant that this fair treatment was to allow them one last chance to lay down their arms. Caldwell advised them the Tryon was not going to back down, and that those not under charges should return home and that the others should submit to arrest peacefully. Earlier negotiators were being held as prisoners by Tryon. The regulators were holding two prisoners of their own and attempted a prisoner exchange which was refused. One of the prisoners, Robert Thompson, attempted to leave at which time he was shot in the back. Popular tradition claims that Thompson was shot by Tryon himself, but this is a point of great dispute. But this was attested to by E.W. Carruthers in his book, The Life of David Caldwell, as having been sworn to him personally by several actual uh, living re uh, regulators. Tryon had read them the riot act that morning and advised them to disperse after the failed third negotiation by David Caldwell, both Herman Husbands and Caldwell himself rode away. According to Carruthers, Caldwell had scarcely gotten out of sight when the firing commenced. Tryon had sent his adjutant to tell the regulators that their time was up and they must lay down their arms or be fired upon. The regulators replied, fire and be damned. Tryon had positioned the Orange County militia at the head of his troops, and they were reluctant to fire upon their own neighbors. Tryon rose in his stirrups, rode to the head of the line, and ordered, Fire! Fire on them or fire on me! Some accounts say that the regulators had been imbibing uh, that morning and were full of bravado. Prior to the opening shots, they had been bearing their chest and daring the militia. Some of them had even engaged in fistfights and inflicted wounds with cutlasses. 
These accounts differ from Carruthers' witnesses, who were all placed further back and could not have known if any of this took place. The one-sided battle began just before noon and took place for between 90 minutes and two hours. The regulators exhausted their ammunition and were forced from the field. The deadliest man among the regulators was James Pugh, who laid behind a rock now known as Pugh's Rock and shot 15 or 16 men as others reloaded for him. They were surrounded and Pugh was captured. Now there's some evidence that instead of James Pugh, this may have actually been his brother Enoch Pugh. Uh, but history up until recent years has said that it was James Pugh. I'm coming to you from beautiful, historic Hillsboro, North Carolina. The day after the battle, Tryon and his militia exercised a scorched earth sweep across uh, the area against the regulators. One of their first acts was to hang James Few, a mentally unstable 25-year-old carpenter who refused to renounce his regulator ties. Uh, that's James Few, F-E-W, uh, not James Pew. Judgment was pronounced and exacted without trial. Many believe that there was personal bad blood between Few and Fanning surrounding Few's fiance as being the reason that he was singled out. Uh, they also attempted to do the same thing with Robert Messer. However, Messer's wife and children intervened on his behalf and uh, he was spared and just taken into custody. The militia proceeded to burn crops and homes of many of the regulators in retaliation on a punitive march over, across the area. Fourteen prisoners were tried and found guilty on June 18, 1771, in the courthouse on the square in Hillsboro. The courthouse in Hillsboro is still standing. It's about a quarter of a mile to my right down the hill. Some were pardoned, and the next day, six were hanged, including James Pugh from Pugh's Rock, Benjamin Merrill, and Robert Messer, who had been spared earlier. Sentence was passed and they were executed on this spot to my left and slightly behind me where that metal enclosure stands in memorial. I'm coming to you from the uh, what was the estate of the plantation of uh, Colonel Michael Holt. Uh, his home was off to the right, I mean off to the left and uh, his family cemetery is over my shoulder and uh, there's a historic marker there. Well many of the regulators scattered to other states. Some signed an oath of loyalty and remained in North Carolina. A large number became prominent in the coming revolution. Governor Tryon was commissioned as a major general in the, uh, in the British Army and he masterminded an unsuccessful plot to kidnap George Washington. Elijah Clark became one of the top commanders of the Georgia militia. The brother of James Few, who was hung without trial, William Few, signed the U.S. Constitution from the state of Georgia. Richard Caswell became the first governor of the state of North Carolina. Captain Michael Holt whose place we're on, commanded a company of uh, Tryon's uh, militia, and it was on his land that the battle was fought. He went on to be a colonel in the Loyalist militia, fighting against the Patriots during the American Revolution, and then late in the war, he had a change of heart, and he switched loyalties to become a Patriot. Regulator Dr. John Powell remained loyal and became a Tory colonel at, uh, in the Revolution. After having stopped briefly at Colonel Michael Holt's plantation, his force of 200 men were soundly defeated with over a hundred being killed in an ambush in a brief skirmish that lasted 10 minutes on the road nearby within about a hundred yards off to the right uh, by Patriot Colonel Light Horse Harry Lee. 
Colonel Powell actually uh, used his skills as a doctor to treat the both uh, not only his own men but the Patriot wounded, and he continued doing so till the end of the war and ended up staying here uh, as a uh, as an American citizen. While this at the Battle of Alamance might not have been the first shots fired of the upcoming revolution, Dr. William Powell called it a grand object lesson to the people of the whole country. And he noted that it aroused sympathy in Philadelphia and Massachusetts. The final words of James Pugh under the gallows sums it up best. Our blood will be as good seed in good ground that will soon produce 100 fold. Final thought on why we study history is spoken to us by Colonel Michael Holt, literally from the grave. These words were on his original tombstone, which is no longer in this cemetery. But we know what those words were because a historian took the time to write them down. It's a poem. Remember man as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you must be, prepare for death, and follow me. Thank you.